Good afternoon, class. This is going to be the first lecture of our virtual series for the emergency medical responder class here in Wilcox County. Uh, lecture one is going to cover the basics of the EMS system. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, so what is an EMR? Okay. An EMR is the first medically trained individual to arrive on scene in an emergency. This could be a uh, firefighter, a police officer, could be just a member of the community who's received some uh, medical training and is there to, you know, assist with the whatever emergency is going on. Uh, EMR plays a big role in the EMS system, uh, especially in more rural counties. The response for the paramedics and EMTs to get there can be extended sometimes. And the EMR has the ability to get on scene and provide some emergency care, get everybody stabilized, and also go ahead and give the paramedics and EMTs en route to the scene a heads up of what they're dealing with. That way they can try to start, you know, deciding where we're going to have to transport to the hospital and everything, you know, from there. Okay, so after you take, after you make contact and uh, do your thing, who takes care of the patient after you? So the uh, immediately next uh, step in the process is going to be the paramedics and EMTs that arrive on scene in the ambulance. Uh, when they arrive, it's going to be your job to give them a heads up, tell them what you've done, what's going on with the patient, give them more details than dispatch was able to give them. Uh, when these guys leave the scene, they're going to be transported to the emergency room. There, they're going to make contact with nurses, doctors, and you know a bunch of al other allied health professionals, just depending on what situation is going on. Um, and you know, from there, they're going to go just to whatever you know final destination they need to get to to get the proper care that they need, whether that be the OR to the ICU, you know, wherever that may be in the hospital. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the EMS system. Um, Wilcox County's EMS system is a fairly rural system. Uh, means that everybody there is even more important because you don't have a whole lot of resources. So the EMS system always starts off with the uh, caller. This is the individual that calls 911. They may have witnessed the accident. They may be a family member of the individual that has uh, become ill. So they're going to call 911. Okay, the next individual that's going to get there is going to be the first responder. That's going to be uh, you guys here. And you're the first on scene. You're the first one to be able to make contact with whoever's ill or injured. And you're going to, you know, make the difference between whether they have a good outcome or a bad outcome a lot of times. All right, after that, you got the EMTs and paramedics, as we talked about before, uh, emergency department, or whatever department you're going to when you arrive at the hospital. Then you've got a uh, medical director who's ultimately in charge of the EMS system as far as, uh, you know, medical operations and stuff goes. So... If you need to make contact with your medical director for clarification or, you know, for advice on scene, uh, you guys can make contact with them directly. Most of the time it would actually be the EMTs and paramedics coming on scene who would make contact with them, but they are available for you as well. All right, we talked about the caller already. That's just the individual who's going to call 911 and activate the EMS system. All right, so dispatch. Um, so dispatch is a very important part of the puzzle here. They receive the call from the caller, and then they're going to ensure the appropriate personnel and equipment are dispatched to the scene. So these dispatchers have to take whatever the caller is telling them and figure out what kind of response is needed. And a lot of times they're dealing with a distraught caller that can't really give proper, you know, information. So they're having to deal with whatever they're given. And sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. But, you know, all they can do is relay the information they're given. Uh, they might dispatch you by phone, by pager. 
by a computer or any other means, but their ultimate goal is to get the appropriate um, response to the scene in a timely manner. <laughs> right, so then you've got the emergency medical responders, which will be you guys. I know a lot of you are already uh, functioning as emergency medical responders now. Uh, but hopefully through this class, we're going to you know, give you guys some more tools to add to your toolbox and make it where you're able to you know, interact in the EMS system a little bit more effectively. Uh, so a lot of times it's going to be firefighters and law enforcement personnel uh, that are going to be first on scene. That's especially true here in Wilcox. Uh, you have a you know, fairly large geographic area to cover. Uh, the population is not very dense, uh, but it's just a, it's a large county. Uh, you've got your ambulances are you know pretty centralized in town but they've got you know i'm not sure the exact distance but i mean they've got a pretty significant amount of travel time to get to the far end of the county on either side um the emr is a key element in uh, providing high quality emergency care especially in that time between when the call is dispatched to ems and the time they can actually arrive on scene a lot of you guys are you know, spread out throughout the county and your response to a scene maybe two or three minutes where, you know, uh, I, I don't have the exact figures, but the ambulance may take 10, 12, you know, 15 minutes to get to the um, scene of the accident or illness, especially at night. So, you know, you're a very, very important part of the EMS system. All right, so EMTs and paramedics, um, in Georgia, recognize a EMT basic, a AEMT or advanced EMT, and a paramedic. In Wilcox County, uh, you guys uh, run advanced life support ambulances, which means there's at least one paramedic on the ambulance at all times. Uh, they're able to, you know, do a little bit more advanced care than advanced EMTs are, and uh, you got some more training, and they're able to just you know work out some things that you know some providers with less training aren't able to do all right so once you arrive at the hospital um you know you're gonna the chain of care is gonna continue so the biggest thing about selecting the hospital is making sure we're getting the patient to the most appropriate facility um here in Wilcox County, we don't have a hospital. Uh, we have hospitals in, you know, most of the counties that are, you know, surrounding us. There's one in Pulaski County. There's one in Dodge County. There's one in Chris County. I do not believe there's one in Ben Hill County. Um, but just because we have hospitals in the surrounding area doesn't necessarily mean that they're the best hospital for the um, situation. So if you got somebody that's been involved in a motor vehicle accident and it's uh, major trauma where we're you know we're looking at multiple trauma with multiple major injuries uh, these smaller hospitals may not have the resources to deal with the patient so we're gonna have to select a hospital that's more appropriate uh, generally your best option from here is gonna be Macon um, it's quite a quite a ride up there but at the end of the day it generally is uh, worth the extra transport time to go ahead and get them where they need to be in the first place uh you know you've also got the option of you know activating a air response air evac um you know they can be here pretty quickly you know just one of those things you have to weigh out the system and when you guys arrive on scene you've got to look at it and if you think it may be something that we need to get air evac involved in you need to go ahead and get them activated all right, so public health and EMS, this is a topic that a lot of people don't really uh, think about, but they play a large role in, you know, just general health in the community. Uh, so responsibilities of public health departments include uh, making sure restaurants are clean and not spreading disease throughout the community. Uh, got large immunization programs, and they prevent the spread of infectious diseases. Uh Public health, you know, works hand-in-hand hand with EMS. Prevention is 
huge and it's a lot easier to prevent disease, infection, and injury than it is to treat it later. All right, so let's talk about the history of EMS a little bit. Um, so I work for Grady Health System, City of Atlanta, and Grady claims that they've had ambulances in service since 1892. Um, I've also got, actually got a picture of a um, horse-drawn ambulance in front of Grady Hospital. I'm not sure on the date of it, but they've got it posted in the hospital. So the idea of EMS has been around for a long time. However, it wasn't what it is now. So around the 50s and 60s, uh, funeral homes, hospitals, you know, and volunteer rescue squads provided most of the ambulance services. Um, in the 50s and 60s, an ambulance was pretty much just a car that you could load a patient into and drive really fast to the hospital. There was not really any emergency care going on. There wasn't, you know, a lot of, there, there was really no formal training for, you know, EMTs or paramedics. They didn't even exist at that time. And, you know, you just did the best you could and got him to the hospital and hoped for the best. Uh, since then, we've obviously, you know, changed a lot. All right, so in 1966, the Accidental Death and Disability uh, Act was uh, published. The uh, paper highlighted deficiencies of the emergency medical care. In the 70s, USDOT developed a national standard for EMS training. Right, so in the 80s, the use of advanced life support with the EMS system became more common. Uh, you started seeing a lot more paramedics come through. Um, you know, some of the guys in the county were some of the first paramedics in the state. You'll, uh, you know, run into them throughout the class. Some of these guys will be teaching some of this class, and they can give us a lot more firsthand knowledge of the history of EMS and kind of, you know, how it, what it was like going through all these changes. All right, so there's a 10 standard components of EMS system. Uh, so you got regulation and policy. You got resource management. Human resources and training. Transportation. Medical support facilities. Communication systems, public information and education, trauma system and development, medical direction, and evaluation. Let's talk a little bit about transportation. As right, so a transportation, three patient condition conditions require uh, the patient's condition requires care by medical professionals. But in the arriving, uh, that but the speed at which they arrive at the medical facility is not critical. All right, so then you've got prompt transportation. This is when a patient's condition is serious enough that it that the needs of the patient to be taken to and transported to a medical facility with the care of medical professionals, and they also need to get there kind of quick. So they they don't have to get there at the speed of light or anything, but they do have a time sensitive situation going on. They need to get there as soon as they can. So a rapid transport is utilized only when EMS personnel are unable to stabilize a patient in the field. All right, so this would be a situation where, say, if it's an ALS unit and they can't control the airway, they've tried to intubate the patient several times and they just can't control the airway. There's blood and, you know, all kinds of vomit and stuff in the airway and it's just uh, putting the patient at risk for death very quickly if they don't get under control. Uh, you also may have a situation where you can't control a major bleed. You know, it's literally the only time we're really just doing a rapid transport is when we just can't get the patient stabilized in the field. We just don't have the tools or equipment 
to make it happen. All right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, EMR training or emergency medical responder training. This is what you guys are uh, getting started with now. So the basic skills found in this course are the foundation for all EMS training. Uh, that statement could not be more true. Um, you're going to learn the basics of how to care for a patient. And I'm a paramedic. I've been a paramedic for 10 years. And on a daily basis, I use the same things that I learned when I went to school to be an EMR in 2007, I believe it was. Um, it's pure basic medicine, and it goes a long way with treating just all, you know, all types of injuries or illnesses. It's just a foundation, and the importance of that cannot be overstressed. Uh, so skills that you're going to learn are going to be divided into two, dro two groups. Uh, you're going to have medical skills, which are going to be, you know, for non-injured, non-trauma patients, maybe individuals experiencing uh, respiratory issues. It may be somebody experiencing some type of cardiac issue or heart attack or, you know, anything that's not related to trauma. Um Trauma is the next uh, group that you're going to look into. Uh, everybody sees trauma as being more exciting and, you know, gets adrenaline going. And a lot of people in this business, you know, live for the trauma calls. They are a large portion of which, you know, you will respond to, especially with the fire department. You'll go out to a lot of motor vehicle accidents. You'll go out to, you know, in Wilcox County specifically, a lot of agriculture accidents. And it's just something that all of the skills that you're going to learn are just critical to be able to take care of your patients. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the basics of uh, trauma care. Um with any patient, whether it's trauma or medical, your priorities are always going to be managing airway, breathing, and circulation. If those three things are not intact, everything else is a uh, you know, non-issue. You've got to make sure airway, breathing, circulation are intact or there's nothing else you can really do. Um, so major thing to look at is uh, controlling external hemorrhage uh, that's going to be you know major you know like arterial bleeding and stuff like that after you get any of that controlled you're going to be treating shock treating wounds and you know splinting injuries to stabilize long bones like your arms and legs that's important but that obviously comes after you know everything else that's that's great to be able to do that, but that's not our priority. All right, so medical patients. Uh, this could be individuals experiencing a heart attack. Uh, it could be somebody having a seizure. It could have be, you know, especially here in the summertime, environmental injuries are very common. Uh, you know, it gets really hot out here. A lot of us do manual labor outside, don't hydrate. Just sets us up for, you know, major issues with the heat. Um, we do have, you know, fairly high instance of alcohol and drug abuse here in the county. Those can be especially challenging. Uh, poisonings is another thing related to agriculture. I mean, you're dealing with a lot of pesticides, a lot of uh, herbicides, and they can have major, you know, implications if people are using them incorrectly or there's an accident. Uh, bites and stings are always the issue, especially in rural areas. Um, people can be highly allergic to bee stings or, you know, anything else. And, you know, anaphylactic reaction is a true, real emergency. It's something that you really have to get on top of quickly or, you know, they could go downhill real fast. Um, altered mental status could be from any cause. A lot of times it's from trauma. A lot of times it's from medical problems. Uh, we'll, we'll get further into that, you know, as we go through the class uh, behavioral emergencies is something that is not as prevalent 
in your rural areas, from my experience, as it is in your urban areas. Um, when I started working in Atlanta, I, I just could not believe how many, you know, calls we get on a daily basis for, you know, behavioral emergencies or, you know, psych problems and stuff like that. Uh, when I worked down here in uh, South Georgia, I didn't really have many of those incidents, but we'll go over them more, you know, as far as how to treat them and what to do as the class progresses. Uh, emergency childbirth is something that always gets everybody a little uh, on edge. Um, something we'll talk about a lot, and you're very likely to, you know, encounter this at some point in your career. I've delivered, you know, several babies, you know, in the field, and honestly, if you, you know, just know how the process is going to go, it's a, it's a pretty simple, straightforward, you know, experience, and, you know, it's it's not as bad as what most people think it is. All right, so what are our goals, um, you know, when it comes to EMR or emergency medical responder training? So the goal of EMR training is to teach you how to evaluate, stabilize, and treat patients using a minimum of equipment. And the reason we say a minimum of equipment is a lot of times you're going to be responding to this scene in your personal vehicle. Uh, you're not going to you know, drive to the station, get the engine or the uh, rescue truck, and go out to a scene with a jump bag full of equipment. You may just be in your personal vehicle with whatever small amount of equipment you have, and that's okay because, you know, we can improvise. We can look at the equipment we have, and we can even look into you know, the patient's home and use things that they have in their house, you know, in place of, you know, things that you would generally have on an ambulance or a more equipped jump bag. You know, that's a huge part of what we're going to learn is how to improvise and how to make the best of what we got. Uh, so after the EMTs and paramedics arrive on scene, you know, your role is going to kind of change into uh, what can you do to you know, help them continue with the patient care. What can you do to assist these paramedics and EMTs that are arriving? How can you make the transition and evolution of getting this patient from the scene of the incident or illness to the hospital? How can you make it easier? Um, so there's also a few things that we should not do. Um, some big things to look at are uh, moving injured or ill patients without the proper equipment or personnel. Um, if you've got somebody that's in a area that you can manage them where they're at um, or you don't have to move them, a lot of times that's going to be the best thing we can do uh, is to leave them in place until we get the ambulance there with the stretcher and more personnel and more equipment. That way we're not having to move them three or four times. Uh, you know, you get somebody with a, you know, a lot of, you know, major trauma going on. You got some broken bones. You don't want to move them 20 feet over this way, and then move them over here, then move them over there. And then when the ambulance gets here, we're going to move them again and put them on a stretcher. Now, you also don't want to judge patients for any reason, but especially based on their cultural uh, background, their religion, color, gender, sexual orientation, age, or socioeconomic status. Uh, you know, when somebody activates the 911 system, they're already having the worst day of their life. Uh, there's no place in emergency care for judgment. Um, you know, you got to go and you got to go respond and... Whoever that is that you're responding to, it doesn't matter. Uh, you're there to help them. You're there to make everything better. It's you know, it's not your place to judge anybody for anything once you get on scene. All right, so we got to know how to improvise, guys. Um, like I said, you may or may not have a lot of equipment at your disposal, but that's all right. We can work with that. Um, you know, four by fours are great for controlling bleeding, but 
uh, paper towel works also. Um, if you've got a stair chair to carry somebody out of, out of a house, that's great. But a chair from the kitchen table will work just as well, you know, as long as you make sure everything's, uh, you know, secure and it's a sturdy chair before you get to moving. Uh, you've got to be kind of like MacGyver. You've got to figure things out. Um, good way to look at things as long as it's safe, you're not causing the patient arms, patient harm, uh, something is better than nothing. And you got to know how to assist your paramedics and EMTs. Uh, when these guys come out here, a lot of times they're coming from a uh, pretty long transport. You may have already been on scene for 10, 15 minutes with the patient. Um, when they arrive, they may be getting ready to do some more advanced procedures. Um, and you might be required to come in and assist them at any time. I mean, you may have a paramedic that's uh, getting ready to intubate somebody. And if you're familiar with the process and you're familiar with their equipment, you're familiar with what, you know, different pieces of equipment they may need throughout the process, then you could easily step up and be like, uh, you know, right there, you know, as their right hand man, able to prepare their equipment, get it ready for them, and just make that procedure they're getting ready to do so much easier. Alright, so just some things to think about. We've talked about Wilcox County being, you know, different than, say, Atlanta. Um, urban areas are just so different from rural areas. They both have their own challenges. Uh, rural areas, you've got a lot more potential for high-speed motor vehicle accidents just because the traffic's less congested. You've got a uh, higher incident of um, agricultural incidents. There's just a lot more people, you know, doing different things than you're doing inside of a city. Um, as far as the medical uh, calls and incidents, I mean, those are largely the same. Um, you know, there there's sick people everywhere. The, a lot of the major differences you're going to see are in trauma. Um, regional variations in climate require specialized equipment. Uh, here in South Georgia, you know, our summers are really hot we generally have fairly mild winters you know at least uh relatively speaking uh you know we may drop below freezing a few times throughout the year but we're not you know negative 13 degrees you know 20 30 days out of the year like some states are and you know your specific system may require special skills that you know some other systems don't um that's something we'll need to get with Wilcox County EMS and Charles and the guys over there and just see if there's anything specific to the county that we need to go over, you know, during this training. And that's something we will definitely address. All right, so roles and responsibility, and this goes for EMR, EMT, you know, at any level in the uh, EMS system. So the one of the major things that a lot of people – seem to forget about or kind of put in the back of their mind is maintaining your own health. It's very important as a first responder to, you know, be in decent physical condition. And it's even more important to, you know, have your mental health in check. Uh, you can't effectively help people if you're, you know, not well yourself. It's just a, it's a hard thing to do. Uh, you got to make sure your equipment's maintained. You don't want to get on scene and have equipment that's not functioning properly, not working. You know, you're not able to, you know, perform your duties because you, you didn't maintain or check your equipment. Uh, you got to respond to emergencies. Uh, after you get there, you, you're looking for scene safety. Um, you know, that that's huge. Scene safety is a major thing. Um the longer I've been in the business, the more I appreciate making sure my scene is safe. That brings us to our next point. you got to protect yourself, guys. Um, we're all here to help others, but if you don't protect yourself, you can't help anybody. Uh, your safety and your partner's safety or you know, members of your crew, um, that's the priority. 
every day. You got to protect yourself. Uh, you got to protect your patients from further harm. They've already been in an accident or they're already ill. We don't want to cause them injury, uh, you know, by negli being negligent or, you know, causing them harm by whatever reason. If you need additional resources, request them. Um, the biggest thing about that is request them early. You can always send them back, but once you get there and you realize you need somebody, it's it's going to take some time to get them there. So request your additional resources early. Get them coming to you. If you need to you know, cancel them, that's fine. you got to learn to assist your EMTs and paramedics. Uh, a lot of the guys from Wilcox County are going to be coming into the class to help us out. They'll be able to give us some, you know, good information about what can we do to assist them, you know, day in, day out. And that's that's going to be some valuable information for us and because we all want to work together. Uh, you may be asked to gain access to patients. Um, I'm not sure. I do not believe Wilcox County EMS does their own extrication. So, uh, and a lot of you guys will be responding with the fire department, you know, and you're going to be doing the job to gain access to patients that are in, you know, motor vehicle accidents that are trapped or if someone's in a house trapped or a building collapse, you guys are going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting and getting people, uh, you know, situated where we can get access to them. Um, you're going to administer emergency care, of course. You'll move patients only when it's necessary. Like I said earlier, if you can treat the patient where they're sitting at, that's what we'd rather do. We don't want to move them, you know, as many times, you know, four or five times when we can just wait and move them once. Uh, if you get on scene and you're by yourself and you need to get something done to save someone's life or, you know, prevent further harm, you can enlist the help of whoever's around. I mean, if they've got family members there, if this is in a public place and you've got people standing around watching, I mean, you know, say, hey, guys, I need some help. I will tell you what to do, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to need you to help me out. And you know, most of the general public is very willing to help out when there's an emergency situation going on. Uh, you got to keep your knowledge and skills up to date. Um, you can't take this class in 2020 and not look at anything or do any continuing education 10 years from now because you're, you're going to forget a lot of the stuff you learned. It's your responsibility to keep up to date. You just, it's just something we all have to do. It's, it's just super important. I mean, you got to document your care. I'm not sure if you guys have anything in place uh, for documenting your care on medical calls, but it's something that, uh, you know, is really important. It's a great idea to just have a little form where you can jot down what you did, what happened. That way, if anything, you know, comes of it, if you have to recall anything, you've got a legal document sitting there that you can uh, reference. Because, I mean, I've been called for uh, the court on calls that happened seven, eight, ten years ago, and there is absolutely nothing that I can remember about the specific call. But if I have my uh, patient care report available, I can always reference it, and, you know, at least tell the uh you know court hey guys this is my report this is what happened um i know this is what happened because i documented it right after the call so that's just something really important to think about uh, that brings us you know back into documentation again it should be clear it should be accurate um and it should be done you know as quickly after the call as you can um, it provides the basics to evaluate the quality of care given. Just kind of tells the story about what you did when you got there. All right, so your documentation should include the condition of the patient when you find them. Uh, that just means what was going on with the patient, what was their uh, status of their airway breathing circulation, um, you know, what did the patient tell you was wrong with them, what was the patient's description of the injury or illness that they're experiencing. Uh, you'd want to get an initial set of vital signs, and depending on how long you're there, you may get a second set or third set. just depends on how critical the patient is and how long you're there. What was the treatment that you provided? The agency and personnel that took over the patient care, uh, that's generally for you guys going to be Wilcox County EMS. Uh, they're going to respond, and uh, it's just a good idea to 
you know, document who you handed that patient care off to just in case, you know, anything comes up and anybody has any questions for you. Um, and also on your documentation, just anything else, anything that seems important to you at the time, it's always a good idea just to jot it down just in case you need to recall it later. It's always great to just have it in writing. All right, so let's talk a little bit about your attitude and conduct. Um, an EMR should have the following characteristics. Uh, you should always be honest and have integrity. Uh, you guys are being called to people's homes or, uh, you know, scenes of accidents at sometimes the, you know, worst moment in their life. Um, they've got to know that they can trust you. They've got to know that you're a person of good character and you have some integrity about you or, you know, they're not going to feel comfortable uh, with you being in the house and that goes especially true you know in these smaller more rural communities you know everybody knows everybody uh and you're going to be responding to people's homes that you you know know and are member, also members of the community uh you got to be aware of the feelings of the patient and the family like i've said multiple times in this lecture you're going to somebody's house at the worst day of their life i mean they it's just it's one of those situations where you can't even imagine it unless you've been in there and people can be emotional they can be upset they can uh you know you, you've just got to be aware of that and have a little bit of empathy for them now you got to be motivated to get the job done you know when you arrive on scene it's it's not a game it's, it's not fun uh nobody wants to be in these situations you know but somebody has to and that's you guys uh, so you got to be motivated to do whatever needs to happen. Uh, you got to look at the situation. You've got to work it out. And you've got to work with the EMS system, uh, you know, the entire team to make it happen. You also have to know your limitations. Um, and that goes for any member of the EMS team. Uh, we all have different limitations. We all have different levels of training. We all have uh, different things that we're good at. And we have things that we're weak at. And we just have to be aware of these limitations because sometimes it's better to uh, realize your limitations and wait on some more resources to get there instead of doing something and causing the patient more harm. you got to be an advocate for your patients. If you get on scene and you've got your patients, you've made contact with them, that's your patient. You have got a, uh, you've got a responsibility for that patient. You've got to make sure that you do everything you can for this patient to, uh, you know, get the best care and be in the best situation possible. But that's got to be a priority for you. Uh, your appearance. Um, I mean, I, I'm a realist, guys. Uh, you know, we're not all going to be pressed and clean and, um, you know, be wearing a uniform every day. Uh, a lot of us, when we're responding to these calls, are going to be coming from, you know, our job. Uh, maybe getting up in the middle of the night out of bed. Um, you know, there's no telling. That's it's, it's why it's called an emergency. Nobody can plan for an emergency. You just have to, you know, do the best you can when you get there. That being said, though, you can, you know, do a little bit of, put in just a little bit of effort to, look neat and clean i mean you don't have to have on a uniform and be pressed to look neat and clean but if you're going to somebody's house at three o'clock in the morning because what whatever reason they decided they had to call 911 you want to look presentable uh you know at least have on a you know pair of pants and a decent t-shirt you know don't go in there in your pajamas don't go in there just looking like a mess. Just just take just a little bit of time and try to look presentable when you're going to somebody's house. That goes a long way. Uh, you know, your perception and how people see you just makes all the difference in the world sometimes, and it can give people a lot more confidence in you. Like I said, I'm a realist. I know we can't all, you know, be pressed and clean all the time, but just keep that in the back of your mind, guys. All right, so medical oversight. Um, so we talked about before, Wilcox County's got a medical director. Uh, the function of a medical director is to develop policies and procedures and uh, clinical care guidelines. Uh, most of that goes for your 
EMTs and paramedics. I'm not sure that Wilcox County actually has any guidelines in place at this time specifically for EMRs. That's something we'll have to look into. Um, your medical director may provide indirect medical control by uh, directing training, setting policies and procedures, ensuring high quality management of the EMS system. Um, you know, they they work out all the major issues when it comes to uh, managing this system as far as the medical stuff goes. Uh, the medical director may also provide online medical control by being in direct contact with EMS personnel uh, via telephone or radio. Like I said, that's mostly going to be with the EMTs and paramedics that are responding in the ambulance. Um, or they may even respond to the location of an incident uh, and provide medical direction. I mean, if you've got a major incident, say a uh, you know a large school bus or passenger bus, you know, had a catastrophic incident somewhere in between Abbeville and Rochelle, and you had you know thirty, forty, fifty patients that were all critically injured. Um, depending on your medical director's availability and where they're at, they may come out to the scene and try to help triage, help get everything worked out, contact some of the local hospital to see how much they can, how many different patients they can take, what level of acuity patients they can take. Uh, medical director has the ability to take in a lot of roles. It just kind of depends on the individual medical director. That's a quality improvement. Uh, this is something that most EMS services have uh, down at the EMR level. Uh, that's not something that's terribly common, but it's still a great idea. Uh, so this is a process that's used by medical care systems to evaluate the effectiveness and safety of current treatment and procedures. Uh, the following are the six uh, components of quality improvement. you got safety, effectiveness, it's got to be patient-centered, it's got to be timely, it's got to be effective, and it's got to be uh, equitable. Uh, so you just got to look at it with those six different components and make sure everything's in line with that. All right, so your, your certification. All right, so once you're certified as an EMR or emergency medical responder, you must follow the national state or state standards for your level of service. It's your responsibility to keep your uh, certification current. You gotta maintain your educational requirements. You gotta keep your skills up to date. And you know, any failure to do so can result in your certification lapsing and or, you know, you just having some, you know, issues that you don't wanna deal with. Alright, so in summary, guys, uh, the emergency medical responder is the first medically trained person to arrive on scene. Uh, talked about before, a lot of times this is police officers, firefighters that also have some medical training. It's absolutely critical for the EMS system to have uh, highly trained emergency medical responders that can get there quicker than the paramedics and EMTs. Uh, just because minutes can save a life and you know this business uh, the sequence of events of the EMS system are uh, reporting that's your caller you got dispatch emergency medical response uh, that's gonna be you guys the EMRs you got ambulance response and then at the end of it you got hospital care uh, the four basic goals of EMR training are uh, to know what not to do how to use equipment how to improvise, and how to assist other providers. The EMR's goal is to provide immediate care for the sick and injured, injured individuals on the scene. Like I said, you may get there 5, 10, 15 minutes before paramedics and EMTs do, and what you do during that time that you're there by yourself can make the difference between life and death. It, it cannot be overstated how important that is. Uh, your documentation should be clear and reflect the patient care provided. Uh, you got to maintain the confidentiality of the patient's information, guys. Um, it's super important. And it's, I don't want to say it's more important, but it hits home a little more in our smaller communities. Uh, we don't need to be broadcasting, 
you know, what happened to, you know, our neighbor three houses down the other night, you know, just because we went on scene and it's, you know, we find it as an interesting story. That's just not, it's just not appropriate. You know, you wouldn't want anybody doing that to you or your family and, you know, you just need to make sure you're not doing anybody else. You also just got to be familiar with your protocol set by the medical director. Uh, that's something we need to get in uh, line with, you know, Wilcox County EMS with and just go over, you know, what their expectations of uh, EMRs in the county are and what, you know, EMRs can do to make their job easier. All right, guys, well, that wraps up lecture one. Uh, please bear with me. It's the first time I've done virtual lectures before. Um, so I'm going to kind of work on this as we go. Hope you all enjoyed the first lecture, and I will see you on the next one.